There's a moment in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, after you've completed the tutorial and made it through the opening dungeon, where you step out into the world for the first time. Moving from the constricted darkness of the sewers to a world of vibrant greens and dazzling sunshine, stretching as far as the eye can see. If I had to choose one moment in this entire series to best sum up what these games are all about, it would be this one. Oblivion has some problems, but the promise that underpins this series, of giving players a whole new world to step into and lose themselves within, is still alive here. In other ways, Oblivion was a departure from many of the things that made its predecessors so successful, but one thing Bethesda can't be criticised for with this game is a lack of ambition. Releasing four years after Morrowind on a new generation of hardware, Oblivion benefited from the rapid technological progress of the mid-2000s to create a world of higher graphical fidelity with a much greater draw distance. It was also bigger, with a landmass over twice the size of the island of Vardenfell that saw the alien landscapes of Morrowind replaced by the more conventional, inviting forests and rolling hills of Cyrodiil. But the changes weren't limited to the setting. Oblivion also introduced a more advanced physics engine that allowed objects to be manipulated in real time with added ragdoll effects for enemy corpses, as well as more sophisticated lighting and shader techniques that may sometimes seem like they're overdosing on bloom, but were still impressive from a technical perspective. Still, Oblivion's most exciting addition was the Radiant AI system. No longer would NPCs inhabit a single fixed spot in the game world, where they would remain impassively till the end of their days. Now, instead, these characters would have real schedules, governed by pre-programmed behavioural patterns that would lead them to moving about the game world, sheltering during rain, moving to sleep in a bed at night, and engaging in conversation with other NPCs they cross paths with. The result of this system can be awkward, and sometimes even immersion-breaking when it's at its worst, but this was still a hugely ambitious addition that is still, to this day, more advanced than the NPC behaviour seen in many modern RPGs. To go alongside their new routines, every NPC was now also fully voice acted. Get lost or I'll pull your arm off. Annoying creature. This led to an overhaul of the dialogue system where the encyclopedic system of Morrowind was replaced with a much more limited, but slightly more natural system, which resulted in a reduction of quantity of dialogue for each NPC, but also a more unique feel to conversations. As for the amount of voice acting needed for this, it was, by 2006 standards, a truly staggering amount, with Bethesda stating that 50% of the game's disk space was used on voice acting alone. With all these improvements on top of the large, open and interactive world design of its predecessor, it's easy to see why Oblivion wowed critics and consumers alike, cementing Bethesda's name in the world of video games as the king of open world RPGs, and creating the foundation that they'd build on to create many of the best-selling role-playing games ever made. But there's another side to this story. If resentment towards Bethesda's style of games had been slowly growing over the years, bubbling away unnoticed beneath the Metacritic scores and Game of the Year awards, waiting to erupt in the broader public consciousness years down the line, well, this was the game where that began. Because for all the additions and improvements made to Morrowind's formula by Oblivion, there were other things that were lost along the way. First though, I want to say a quick thank you to this video sponsor, Core. One of the most important and enduring aspects of the Elder Scrolls series is mods. Through this user-created content, these games have been able to provide players with hours of additional enjoyment through content that showcased an insane amount of talent and creativity within the community and proved just how important user-created content can be. Core is a new game creation platform which also aims to utilise the power of user-created content to allow users to build, publish and play games for free. If you're new to making games, Core is a great way to get started. Using the power of the Unreal Engine, in addition to thousands of free, high-quality assets, even people with no coding knowledge can create their very own game which you can then publish on the Core platform where it can be played and enjoyed by other users. And if you want to take this even further, you can, using the programming language Lua to create your own game logic, leading to a huge number of different possibilities, making Core a great way to learn about making games, express your creativity, or just check out some of the great stuff other people may have already made. 
There's even a city building jam running at the moment with a $25,000 prize pool. So if you're someone with an interest in game creation, Core is a great platform to try out and it's completely free, so check the link in the description if you're interested. Also, before we begin with the rest of the video, I want to remind people that this is the second video in a three-part series, and I strongly advise you to watch the previous video first if you haven't done so already, as a lot of the arguments featured in this video are building off points raised in the last one. So while I can't force you to watch these videos in order, please know that if you don't, I, much like your parents, will be disappointed in you. But enough stalling. Oblivion begins with the voice of Patrick Stewart, in an introductory cinematic that seems to be doing its very best to appeal to a Lord of the Rings audience. I have seen the gates of Oblivion, beyond which no waking eye may see. Behold, in darkness a doom sweeps the land. It's not just the tone and soundtrack that might seem familiar here. The Oblivion Gates look a whole lot like the Eye of Sauron, and the architectural design of the buildings within the Realm of Oblivion also look a lot like some of those seen in Peter Jackson's movies. Considering the Lord of the Rings movies released only a few years earlier, and were some of the most successful films of all time, it doesn't seem hard to imagine that these movies, which in many ways were responsible for popularising fantasy settings to mainstream audiences, may have had an impact on Bethesda's creative vision for Oblivion. The reason I bring this up, however, isn't due to any concern over the integrity of the Lord of the Rings creative property, but instead to highlight how different Bethesda's approach was here when compared to their previous game. Morrowind was far from being a Tolkien-esque fantasy setting, and its uniqueness made it stand out. To go from the alien and borderline hostile world of Vardenfell to Oblivion's much more traditional and somewhat idyllic setting makes for a big change. Having a more conventional setting isn't necessarily a problem, but these two settings feel so different that it creates a noticeable tonal disconnect between them. Vardenfell and Cyrodiil don't seem like they belong to the same universe, which can harm the world building for returning players. Also, if Bethesda did want to take a step back from Morrowind's weirdness, it's a shame they didn't have anything more unique to replace it with than Oblivion's slightly generic medieval cities and forests. Any similarities to The Lord of the Rings just make the lack of creativity even more apparent, and it's hard not to wonder if this dramatic change in setting wasn't simply an attempt to reach as broad an audience as possible. This could also be why we saw the inclusion of celebrity voice actors, as, in addition to Patrick Stewart, there are other big names putting in a performance here as well, such as Sean Bean. Not much of a speech, was it? Didn't seem to bother them, though. Terence Stamp. Hear now the words of Lord Dagon. And Todd Howard. When? I didn't know that. How can this be? Regardless of your opinion on celebrity voice actors, the decision to include so many big names does seem rather questionable when you consider that most of the other voice acting in this game was performed by just 10 voice actors. This meant there was only one male and one female voice actor per race, and even then some actors had to cover two races, which results in the inhabitants of Cyrodiil sounding overly similar. The Tiber Septim Hotel is a nice place. It's not cheap though. My name is Alicia Ottis. Bye. Go ahead, please. I shopped at Three Brothers a couple of days ago. You too. Rochelle Banty and Samuel's wife. My poor husband is getting no sleep. It's almost as if every single race is a member of one big family, giving these NPCs a rather unnatural quality. A bit like you've taken a wrong turn and ended up at Tamriel's version of Innsmouth, where everyone's far too closely related and may or may not be sacrificing strangers to an old god on weekends. But hey, who needs more than 10 main voice actors when you can have Jean-Luc Picard and Boromir? The unnaturalness of NPCs isn't helped by the similarity in their faces. This time though, it's not that members of each race look too similar to each other, but instead that the races themselves are too similar, 
leading to some races, like the elven ones, just looking like humans with a different skin colour palette and pointy ears. For Dunham I feel particularly disappointing, because they look so little like they did in Morrowind. But, in Bethesda's defence, creating unique faces for so many NPCs back in 2006 was no easy task. Still, this time around, players do at least have access to those creation tools themselves, giving character creation a staggering number of possibilities, which is far beyond the previous games in the series. The exact results of giving people so much freedom may vary between players, as, like Spider-Man's uncle said that one time, with great power comes great responsibility. And while I don't remember that movie very well, it's certainly possible he was talking about Oblivion's character creation. With your unique little snowflake, or blasphemous abomination created, the game begins with the player in jail, but your confinement won't last long, as Emperor Uriel Picard Septim soon joins you, revealing that there is an assassination attempt on his life, and that he must flee the city via a secret passage conveniently located in your cell. And so, after the Emperor and his escort move on, you're free to follow their path, which will take you through the game's first dungeon, where you'll notice that Oblivion has at least made a few important improvements to the basic gameplay. Chief among them being the change to combat, so whether the player hits is no longer determined by dice roll. This change improves the feel of combat encounters as each swing of your weapon is guaranteed to connect, and you can now also actively block enemy attacks. Despite this however, combat can still seem a bit lacking in depth and challenge. The unrealistic ability to pause combat anytime you like to consume potions and fully heal your character is still present, and while you can no longer rest in oblivion without using a bed, waiting for any duration now fully heals you. And so combat remains a weakness for the series, even if the shift to a more action-focused system is itself an improvement. For many people, the solution to this is to improve the action part of combat, with common suggestions being to add dodging, parrying, or maybe a Dark Souls stamina meter. And these suggestions aren't necessarily bad, but it's not the action part of combat that I always thought presented the biggest missed opportunity in these games. It's the strategic side. After all, good action combat is rare outside of very action-focused genres, but an RPG should be able to make up for this through providing greater strategic depth. And yet, in Oblivion, you don't really ever need to change tactics against different enemies, resulting in each combat encounter feeling much the same. This, combined with the lack of danger that results from being able to pause any time to use healing potions, and the lack of consequence that comes from being able to wait after every fight to fully heal, results in Oblivion's combat ending up rather boring. The easiest solution to this would be to only allow resting at beds, while limiting potion use in combat, in order to make preventing damage more important. This could then be complemented by making fighting multiple enemies at once more dangerous, which would be both realistic, as it should be much harder to fight multiple enemies at the same time, while also forcing players to think more about how they approach challenging combat encounters to take advantage of magic, poisons, traps, and other available tools as they're forced to try to find ways to even the odds. Finally, there could be greater differences between enemies, such as more varied movesets or more obvious weaknesses, to add variety to combat and force players to adapt their approach against different foes. As it is though, Oblivion's combat remains one of its greatest weaknesses, even if the removal of dice rolls does make for an improvement on the last game. But combat isn't the only place where dice have been done away with. Picking locks and persuading NPCs now use minigames to determine whether the player is successful. The lock picking minigame requires you to time the movement of a series of pins, which over such a long game ends up getting rather repetitive. Luckily there is the skeleton key that players can acquire, but the relief this key provides seems like clear proof that this minigame might not have been enjoyable enough to be worth including in the first place. Still at least Oblivion removes the need to manually equip lock picks every time you want to use one, which was certainly a part of Morrowind's lockpicking that got rather annoying. It's harder to find any positives about the Persuasion minigame. With lockpicking, it's easy to see how the minigame is trying to simulate the activity it represents. With Persuasion, however, it's hard to even understand what's meant to be happening during the minigame. It works by giving the player four options, Joke, Admire, Boast, and Coerce, to which each NPC has a different level of reaction. 
You then have to line up a wheel as you select each of the four options while trying to maximise the effect of the positive options and minimise the negative ones. Even describing this minigame feels strange. The way it actually plays out is with you looking at an NPC's facial expression as you hover over each option to determine how much they like each one, and then clicking through the wheel over and over to slowly raise an NPC's attitude towards you. This ends up being as tedious as it is absurd, and at no stage does this process ever actually feel connected to persuading someone. This minigame almost feels like it was designed as satire, to show how stupid unnecessary minigames in games can be. It's as if a designer showed it to his boss as a joke, expecting him to laugh at the idea, but somehow the boss actually thought it was good, and then the designer was too embarrassed to tell the truth, and so here we are, staring at these dumb NPCs repeatedly pull these stupid facial expressions until the player gets bored and decides maybe raising an NPC's reputation isn't that important after all. Persuasion wasn't very well implemented in Morrowind. It worked through paying money to bribe an NPC, where the game then rolled a dice to determine how much their attitude to the player increased or decreased. This was boring and rather crude as far as representations of persuading someone go, but it was still much better than this. Regardless, as bad as the persuasion minigame is, it is just a small part of the overall experience, so it can be mostly ignored. There is also one final area of the game where dice rolls are no longer used, which is traps. Here though the change from using chance to determine whether players can disarm something, to creating actual traps within the game's dungeon, is a huge improvement. This new method of using real traps makes them much more interesting to engage with, although unfortunately the damage traps do is so small that you rarely need to worry about triggering them. This seems to be because trap damage doesn't scale in any way, whereas the player does, and also because restoring health is so trivial that any trap that doesn't kill you in one hit will always just be the most minor of flesh wounds. Still, these traps can be fun, particularly if you use them against enemies, as is shown in the first dungeon, which we should probably get back to. After making your way through the first part of this dungeon, which also serves as the game's tutorial, you meet back up with the Emperor. Your reunion is short-lived, however, as assassins from the Daedric cult the Mythic Dawn soon attack, killing the Emperor before your very eyes, but not before he's able to entrust you with the Amulet of Kings, an artifact of immense value that he asks you to deliver to his one remaining heir. The Emperor's decision to entrust the player with this artifact, instead of the remaining members of the Blades who are accompanying him, is questionable, and the scene where the Emperor is actually killed, where control is taken from the player in order to force them to passively watch this happen, plays out rather awkwardly. These two events are needed for the main quest to begin, but their presentation still feels pretty weak, and this type of thing is more common in Oblivion than Morrowind. This is because Oblivion places more focus on making the story and main quest seem exciting, which is also likely why the first quest has an emperor, an assassination, and a world-ending prophecy all thrust upon the player before they're even out of the tutorial dungeon. By comparison, in Morrowind's first quest you really were just delivering a letter to an unknown person for an unknown reason. This trend continues throughout the main quest, but, as seen with the assassination, Oblivion's presentation often stumbles when trying to keep up with the more ambitious and epic events of the story. Still, for now, you can finally make your way to the dungeon's exit, and step out into the blue skies and brilliant sunshine of Cyrodiil. Unlike Morrowind, which began in one corner of the map, Oblivion sets you free in the very centre. This is an interesting starting point, as it creates a much greater sense of freedom for the player right off the bat, by making it obvious to you that you can go anywhere, with no direction you choose being blocked by cliffs or bodies of impassable water. The feeling of freedom this provides is liberating, and the early hours of this experience, where you first get to explore the world on your own terms, might be oblivion at its very best. But while this world is indeed more open than previous games, there is a cost. You realise that all your life you've been coasting along, as if you were in a dream. But now, facing the trials of the last few days, you're exactly the same. Many parts of Morrowind's character systems remain in this game. You still have the same attributes, and mostly the same skills, 
you still level these skills by using them, you still select attributes to increase on level up, and you still receive a bonus based on the number of associated skill increases during that level. Some of the flaws of Morrowind systems also remain, like how the speed you level magic skills is still based on the number of spell casts made, as opposed to the mana cost of the spells. Although destruction and other offensive spells do need to hit an enemy target to increase now, so at least that was fixed. Still in many ways, Morrowind and Oblivion's progression systems are very similar, except for one key difference. Oblivion uses level scaling. This applies to enemies, to dungeons, to quest rewards, to random loot, to locks on chests, and so on. Oblivion's world is scaled to the player's level, and the impacts this has on the experience are many. Firstly, as enemies scale with the player, it means there's little sense of progression through leveling because the stronger the player gets, the stronger enemies get, creating a flatter difficulty curve to encounters. Except it's not completely flat, because rather than scaling each enemy's level, the game instead scales the enemy type. So, for example, if a player is low level, they might find goblins or wolves, but as they get higher level, these goblins and wolves are removed from the game world, and you'll instead find ogres and bears in their spawn locations. For human enemies, like bandits, you will still encounter them throughout the game, but their equipment will scale with the player's level, meaning their armour will go from iron and fur at the start, to glass and daedric later on. This makes the game's difficulty increase as you gain levels, as the new enemy types tend to increase in strength faster than the player does. Although eventually players will reach a point where their character continues to level and increase in strength, but the game is already generating its high level enemy type, which then makes the game get easier again. Mechanically, this makes Oblivion less satisfying, as level ups don't feel rewarding when, in practice, they are actually making the player weaker by making the world stronger. This makes it almost seem like the game is punishing you for choosing to level up, and you also no longer gain the satisfaction from feeling your character grow in strength. Being able to kill a cliff racer in one hit meant something. It's how you know you've truly made it in the world of Morrowind, but you'll never experience this kind of feeling in Oblivion. Scaling also makes the game less exciting, as there's a smaller variety of enemies, which the player always knows will be around the same level of difficulty. So you'll never have to be careful not to stumble into a particularly dangerous opponent, as everything is pretty much the same level of danger throughout the entire experience. All of the things mentioned are real problems to this system, but even more damning might be the impact this has on immersion. Scaling adds and removes types of enemies from the game world. This leads to entire species of creatures apparently popping in and out of existence in accordance with the player's level. It makes sense to see wolves in the wilderness, but level up a few times and wolves apparently just become extinct. Likewise, it makes sense for bandits to have low-level gear, but it doesn't make sense for every single bandit you encounter to have legendary equipment, which is what glass and daedric armour is meant to be. The end result is that the entire world is left feeling like it revolves around the player's level, as if you're the sun at the centre of this universe, which just draws attention to the world's artificiality. It's like a reminder that this is a video game designed around the player, as opposed to being a real place that exists independently from them, and the cost this has on immersion alone is severe enough to question whether it was the right choice for the series. But there are other drawbacks to this system too, like the economic impact. Oblivion's economy starts off as more effective than Morrowind's, as money is made to feel more valuable in the early game due to it being harder to acquire. This completely reverses later on, however, because as soon as enemies start to have very valuable equipment, killing a few bandits becomes enough to make you rich, which means money soon loses all meaning. Then there's the way Oblivion scaling harms the leveling system. Morrowind incentivized min-maxing when leveling, as this allowed players to gain greater attribute bonuses on level up. This was a slight problem, but at least you could rest assured that regardless of what skills you chose as majors, and no matter how big or small the bonuses you received on each level up were, at least each level meant your character became stronger. In Oblivion, this is no longer the case, which magnifies the need to level efficiently and choose the right major skills in order to maximise your attribute gains, as otherwise you risk your character being outscaled by the world. 
This creates a dilemma about what to choose for major skills, as it's these skill increases that will actually level you up. Therefore, if you choose skills that you increase less often, you'll level up more slowly, but as you'll still be increasing your other skills, you'll still be getting stronger while the world will stay the same. In fact, some people go as far as to recommend you never level up at all, which can be achieved by simply never going to sleep, as this is what actually triggers the level increase. This makes for a rather unnatural way to play the game, and the whole idea of selecting major skills is that players are meant to choose the skills they use the most. And yet, a more effective way to play is to do the opposite of this. Basically, if you understand the system, it makes levelling up seem more like a punishment than a reward. If you try to combat this through min-maxing or avoiding levelling, Oblivion's progression system is left feeling tedious and unsatisfying. Meanwhile, for the casual player, who either knows or cares little for the details of this system and just plays the game how it's meant to be played, this system is overly punitive and leads to enemies with bloated hit points that can feel like a chore to fight. And if this levelling system is bad for both casual players and for those more interested in min-maxing, then that's a good indication that this system just isn't very good. Ultimately, Morrowind's character systems already had some problems, but Oblivion makes all these worse without fixing the core issues the system had in the first place. There is one advantage scaling brings, which is you can go anywhere and do anything without ever running into any major barriers. The map is completely open, your path through it can be entirely non-linear, and the quests you do and dungeons you enter will always be an appropriate difficulty. This makes Oblivion one of the most genuinely open RPGs ever made, and this is a big advantage for this particular series. Still, it's hard to argue this one benefit justifies the many costs. It's as if the designers were so concerned that a non-scaled world would have too many rough edges that they took sandpaper to the entire experience, resulting in a world that's flat and lacks some of the detail that made the world feel alive in the first place. You might argue this approach was necessary, but Morrowind is proof that this isn't true, and even Skyrim's more constrained approach to level scaling is a vast improvement. Ultimately, the level scaling is likely Oblivion's worst feature, and while the idea itself is debatable, the implementation is just poor, and this hurts multiple parts of the experience. Still, not everything Oblivion changed was this unsuccessful. In Morrowind, one of the earliest quests in the Fighters Guild tasks the player with going to a nearby house to take care of the owner's rat infestation problem. This wasn't a great quest, but not every quest in Morrowind was. Oblivion has its own take on killing rats in a basement. This quest from the Anvil Fighters Guild starts in a similar way, but when you reach Arvina, the basement's owner, it's revealed that the rats in the basement aren't the problem. Instead, they're her pets, and you've been hired to work out what's killing them. You then check the basement, which reveals a starving mountain lion, which solves the mystery of what's killing the rats, but it still doesn't explain why the lion's here, so you check out a couple leads at Arvina's behest, only to eventually find out that her neighbour has been secretly placing meat outside the basement each night in an attempt to get rid of the rats, which is what ended up leading the lion in. You can choose to tell this to Arvina, or keep the neighbour's secret for them, which slightly alters the reward, but either way, the mystery is solved. Looking at these two quests side by side will tell you a lot about how the quest design has changed in Oblivion. Of course, Oblivion's rat quest is designed to be subversive. It's meant to poke fun at the rats in the basement trope, but this is just one example. Most quests in Oblivion don't try to subvert player expectations, but they do have far more complex narratives than Morrowind's, and it's clear that more attention has been given to trying to use each quest to tell a self-contained story that players will find interesting. These often revolve around some kind of unique premise like going to sleep at an inn that's located on a boat, only for the boat to be taken over and sailed out to sea while you're resting. Or they just have some kind of unusual objective or other twist to try to make them stand out. And to Oblivion's credit, these side quests are successful at standing out. There are plenty of moments of humour, surrealism and excitement to make the average side quest in Oblivion much more memorable than they were in Morrowind. 
This greater focus on the story of a side quest does bring with it a change in tone in the writing. Morrowind tended to take itself quite seriously, although that wasn't always the case. Still, by comparison, Oblivion's writing is much more camp, which is only exaggerated by the hammy voice acting and the more generic setting to give the game a very different feel to its predecessor. Which style you prefer will likely come down to player preference. Oblivion is often more fun, in a low-budget, B-movie kind of way, and that may be exactly what people want from the experience. That said, I do think that if a game wants the player to believe in its world, a more serious approach to its writing might be preferable. After all, it's harder to take the world seriously if the writing doesn't. Still, if there's a problem with Oblivion's quest design, it's not to do with the writing, but instead has more to do with the change in gameplay. In Morrowind, quests were what pushed the player to explore its world. This is because without quest markers to tell you exactly where to go, you had no choice but to pay attention to the world around you to find dungeons and NPCs and items. This meant that even basic quests could provide a feeling of accomplishment for players that resulted from having to find things for yourself. The flip side to this was that having to find things could be frustrating, and that might explain why Bethesda opted to add quest markers to all of Oblivion's quests so that players would always know where to go. In some ways, this change was inevitable for the series, as it follows a broader trend in gaming that saw many games and genres evolve to be more accessible over the 2000s. The goal of removing areas of frustration for players isn't bad either, and there are changes Oblivion makes towards this that are big improvements, like its more user-friendly quest journal. However, the problem with removing the need to find things for yourself is that this removes one of the main things that made Morrowind challenging, and nothing was added to replace this, leaving an experience that can seem somewhat shallow. After all, the combat in this series has little depth, and even if you can turn the difficulty setting up, that just gives enemies more hit points, which only makes fights take longer. Meanwhile, outside of combat, all you need to do is follow the quest marker, which will hold the player's hand as it guides them through every step of every quest, leaving no other source of resistance to this experience, as there's nothing for the player to overcome. This may not be a problem for every player, and for newcomers to the RPG genre, it may make the experience easier to get into. But for players who do want more from the experience, it can leave Oblivion and Skyrim feeling rather lacking. Morrowind's quests also made you feel connected to the world by making you think about how you interacted with it. Even an act as simple as going from one location to another involved some effort from the player, and this was important to the overall experience. Without this, the world is made to feel less important, as your interactions with it are more superficial. To balance the easier quest design, Oblivion placed a greater focus on dungeon crawling. While this is a departure from Morrowind, if you go further back, this really puts Oblivion more in line with the first two Elder Scrolls games, which also focused a lot of their design around this aspect. However, even if this increased focus on dungeons isn't new for the series, that doesn't mean it's beneficial. The greater focus on dungeon crawling doesn't add a lot to the series' core appeal of exploration and immersion when compared with actually spending time in the rest of the game's world. Oblivion's dungeons also lack visual variety, which means you see the same looking caves, forts, mines and alien ruins far too often, and when combined with the already weak combat, this can make dungeons feel overly repetitive, with the ratio of time spent dungeon crawling in Oblivion feeling higher than it should have been. In the end, it's almost as if the game is compensating for its lack of challenge by forcing the player to spend more time in dungeons, which doesn't add more challenge, but can make questing more tedious. This could also be said about finding things for yourself in Morrowind, but I'd still rather spend my time lost within the game's world trying to find something than just going through a large number of dungeons. Still, there is a problem with adding quest markers beyond just the impact this has on gameplay, which is that they aren't realistic. I mean, if an NPC gives you a quest to find a book and tells you, You'll find it at an old ruin called Cloud Top. It's north of Coral, up in the mountains. I'm afraid I don't have an exact location. Then why is it as soon as I open my map, 
the exact location is there with an arrow pointing to it. This doesn't make sense, because where did this knowledge come from? Oblivion, and other games, rely so heavily on quest markers as part of their design that they don't realise how ridiculous these quest markers can be in certain situations, but the logical inconsistencies of these quest markers can still be a problem. If a game does have to have quest markers, they should at least operate in a way that's plausible. For example, if you're instructed to go to a location, and the one giving you the instructions knows where this location is, then it's okay for that information to be marked on your map. But if you're told to find an object that no one knows the exact location of, then it's not okay for the quest marker to just magically provide the location. Quest markers shouldn't be omniscient. The Elder Scrolls games put a large focus on creating believable worlds that players can be immersed in, and using quest markers this way is harmful to this. Having to carefully check your map while paying attention to your surroundings and finding things for yourself is immersive in a way that blindly following a magic marker the whole time isn't. And then there's also the cost this has on exploration, the other key part of this series. I mean, there's not much left to explore when a quest marker has already found everything for you, and where's the sense of discovery if your objective is discovered as soon as you pick the quest up? Quest markers might remove player frustration, but this comes with a cost. Still, it may have been hard for Oblivion to avoid them entirely. After all, its game world is considerably larger than Morrowind's, and the new Radiant AI means NPCs no longer remain stationary in fixed locations, making them potentially much harder to find. Plus, the need to include directions within quests limits their design in some ways, while also introducing problems any time the directions are overly ambiguous. Players may not mind searching for something, but they need to know they're at least searching in the correct area. I am still slightly scarred by my first experience with trying to find a certain Dwemer puzzle box in Morrowind, and it's easy to imagine that in a game with so much content, providing directions for everything might be quite hard to do. And really, when considered within the broader context of the gaming industry, Quest markers were probably inevitable for this series, but that still doesn't mean they needed to tell you exact locations when they could just lead you to a general area, or that they should be included during times when they don't make any sense. There's space in between no quest markers and full quest markers that the series could have at least experimented with, and just because people have become used to seeing overbearing quest markers in games these days doesn't mean there aren't better ways to implement them. Ideally, these quests could have been designed from the perspective that quest markers don't exist, as Morrowind did, and then quest markers could be included as an optional setting that could be toggled on and off. That way players have a choice between which approach they prefer, and if players with quest markers turned off do occasionally get stuck, then the option to turn them back on ensures that this is only a very minor problem. In the end, Oblivion's quests put a much greater focus on narrative than Morrowind's, and even if this led to a change in tone for the series, the overall quality of Oblivion's side stories is generally high, and there are plenty of fun and creative quests in this game. When you consider the quantity of side content in Oblivion, this becomes quite impressive, and the situations you find yourself in through these quests can be very memorable, even if the new quest marker dominated design leaves the actual gameplay seeming much more forgettable. Oblivion's side quests are one of its strongest aspects, but despite the attempt to elevate the stories of these quests, there is something else that may have been lost. Morrowind's quests were individually quite simplistic, but through its quests you learn a lot about the world. In Oblivion, this isn't really the case, which might be because the world doesn't have much for the player to learn about it anymore. One of the most unfair pieces of criticism I've heard over the years about Oblivion is that it's ugly. Because, yeah, the NPC faces might not look very good, nor does most armour, and the bloom may well be excessive. But the thing that matters the most, the actual world, that is a thing of beauty. And dated as the graphics may be, that still hasn't changed. Open worlds have come a long way over the last 15 years, but it's important to consider the standards of 2006, and as soon as you do, you'll realise this game was light years ahead of its competition when it came to creating a world that looked both visually interesting and believable. 
where other developers were still struggling to create open spaces that weren't flat and empty, Bethesda was able to create natural looking hills, mountains, rivers and fields that blended together seamlessly, with a very impressive draw distance that allowed landscapes to be filled with smaller details. These environments looked phenomenal for their time, and even years later the strong artistic merit has allowed them to largely hold up. In fact, when it comes to the visuals of the world itself, Oblivion might be one of the largest technical leaps forward an open world game has ever made, and it deserves credit for that regardless of how goofy some of its NPC faces or in-game armour might be. And while Oblivion doesn't have the visual diversity or uniqueness of Morrowind, it does still have a number of distinct regions that each have their own slightly different style and feel. The alienness of Vardenfell might be missed, but it would be unfair to call Cyrodiil visually boring, as not every world has to look weird to look good. Also, Oblivion's environments were successful at seeming realistic, particularly by the standards of the era, which greatly benefits player immersion. And so it's easy to understand how players might want to explore this place through the strengths of its visuals alone, which is good, because outside of the visuals, Cyrodiil doesn't provide many other reasons to want to explore it. Morrowind's world may have looked basic, and its NPCs may have lacked daily routines, but underneath that dated exterior, its world had a true sense of depth. This was a place with real political, religious and cultural tensions, a place where the economic and agricultural realities of its inhabitants' lives were interwoven into the world design, and a place with a history that spanned years and still actively impacted the world itself. In short, all of the components of Morrowind's world felt like they fit together to create a cohesive and interesting whole that was easy for players to believe in. But how much of this still applies to Oblivion? Ignore the main story itself for a second, and just focus on the setting. What are the political, religious or cultural challenges people face here? What are the economic exports of this region? What kind of social conflicts are there? I don't want to be that guy asking, what was Aragorn's tax policy, but even the bigger details that underpin this world seem rather absent in Oblivion. In Morrowind, you had the discontent at the Imperial Legion's presence as a colonial force, the conflict between the Great Houses, the outlawing and continued practice of slavery, the spread of blight diseases, the challenges of farming in such a harsh environment, the restrictions on Duima artifacts and ebony ore as imperial controlled exports, and the different religious and cultural traditions between the many different groups that inhabit the island. And these are just the broader topics, there are more specific examples too. In Oblivion you can find a few comparable examples, like how Breville has a drug problem, and Shadenhall has some minor tensions between its Dunmer inhabitants and the native Imperials, but overall these questions have been given so little attention in this game compared to its predecessor. This is largely the result of Oblivion's quests focusing on telling very self-contained stories, as opposed to being used primarily for world building, but regardless of the cause, the consequence of this is that Oblivion's world seems shallow, and Cyrodiil ends up feeling far less believable as a result. Another aspect of Oblivion's world design which might hinder it is its structure and scale. Cyrodiil is made up of the Imperial City at the centre, which is surrounded by eight smaller cities with evenly spaced dungeons and the occasional village in between. But this structure isn't very natural. For example, all eight of these smaller cities are exactly the same size and share a lot of the same features. In reality, cities vary greatly in size and shape, but in Oblivion, they each feel like they were made using the exact same template, where there's one church, one castle, a complete outer wall, and the same number of buildings and inhabitants in every one. Or what about other smaller inconsistencies in the design, like the number of forts? Oblivion has 52 ruined forts in it. 52 is a big number for a world with such a small population, so why are there so many? And why are they all ruined? And why are they evenly spread out across the map and not placed in strategic locations? Surely forts should be valuable and difficult to build, so it doesn't make sense for they would all be abandoned, let alone that there would be so many in such a small place. In ways like this, and many others, Oblivion's world fails to feel like a real place, and starts to feel more like a space created for players to quest in. 
This makes it come across as more artificial, as when you stop to consider why one part of it is the way it is, the dominant explanation often revolves around what makes sense for Oblivion as a video game, not as an actual place. So why are dungeons so evenly spread out? To allow players to always find new areas when exploring, and so no part of the world feels empty. Why are cities the same size? because Bethesda had technical limitations on the number of NPCs they could fit into one region, and didn't want to make some cities smaller. Why are there so many ruined forts? Because they exist only to be dungeons for the player to go to, and no thought was given to how they fit into the rest of the world. And on it goes. Oblivion's issues of scale are connected to this. For an entire province, Oblivion's overall population feels very low. Its small cities feel more like small towns, and the imperial city doesn't feel close to being the capital of an entire empire. I've heard some people express disappointment over the way Cyrodiil was retconned away from being a jungle as it was described in a book in Morrowind, but I either never read this or didn't remember this detail when I first played Oblivion. What did disappoint me, however, is that this was the homeland of the imperial empire, the most powerful force in the world, who control pretty much the entire continent, and yet they seem small and rather pathetic, which makes it hard to imagine how they could conquer anywhere. This powerful empire barely even seems to exist, and the Imperial Legion itself has a far greater presence on the remote island of Vardenfell, where they're supposed to only have a small foothold, than in the entire province of Cyrodiil, which is meant to be the heart of this massive empire. If Bethesda couldn't represent Cyrodiil or the Imperial Empire at a realistic scale due to technical or design reasons, they should have represented only a part of it at a more realistic scale because that would have made the world more believable. Still, I guess it could be worse. Really, it's impossible to make a completely realistic world. There will always be sacrifices and limitations. But despite its more primitive technology, I think Morrowind did a better job at creating a world which felt like it existed independently of the player, and had the necessary depth to be believable. And it's disappointing that despite the high quality of its visuals, so many other parts of Oblivion's world design feel like a step back. There is one last thing that needs to be covered in this section, which is the ever-controversial subject of fast travel. And, eh, it's not that bad. Okay, maybe there is more that needs to be discussed on the subject of fast travel, but not much more. Oblivion added the ability to instantly travel to any city in the game or any location you have previously visited. This is not a new feature for the series. In Daggerfall you could, and needed to, fast travel to locations and you could do this regardless of whether you visited them before, so it's not like this is new ground for an Elder Scrolls game. That said, Morrowind's method of allowing more limited fast travel through paying for transport at Silt Striders or Mage Guilds, as well as having several spells focused on travel, was more immersive and arguably more satisfying. Oblivion also makes a few questionable decisions regarding fast travel, like how you can fast travel during escort quests, or how you can fast travel to cities without needing to visit them first. Fast travel also makes the world feel smaller, and discovering locations yourself is what gives them a real sense of place within the world, which fast travel harms. Consider arriving at the Imperial City for the first time. You start by seeing this big tower in the distance, and then you cross this rather impressive bridge, and it really feels like you're arriving somewhere important. Or, you could just skip all that by fast travelling straight to one of its districts, and never even see how this place looks from the outside. Or consider the player's first journey to Cloud Ruler Temple, which is another location you're allowed to fast travel to without going there first. You travel here as part of the main story, and this journey acts as a quiet, more reflective section after the more action-packed mission that precedes it. It also takes you along a very scenic road that has some great views, making this one of my favourite parts of the main story. It feels refreshing to be doing something that doesn't involve dungeons or needing to constantly kill enemies, where you can instead just enjoy the environment and the atmosphere as you travel along the road with your companions. It's a memorable journey, and travelling this way makes you feel connected to the world. Or you can just skip all that and fast travel straight to your destination. And that's the problem with fast travel. It is convenient, but the world feels like a less interesting place as a result. 
distance loses its sense of meaning, and the experience becomes less immersive. But maybe the convenience is still worth it. The reality is that after a certain amount of playtime, manually travelling around Oblivion's world can get boring, and fast travel is the easiest solution for this. There might be better solutions, but overall, I'd argue the convenience probably makes up for the drawbacks. One thing that does seem strange about Oblivion's use of fast travel is how you can't fast travel out of a dungeon. This is something you could do in Morrowind and Daggerfall by using the Recall spell, but in Oblivion that spell was removed, forcing you to backtrack through every dungeon just to get out again. Dungeons can be quite large in this game, and there's nothing to see or do as you go back through them, you're just going back over somewhere you've already been a few minutes earlier. So why can't you fast travel out of a dungeon? I'd rather be able to only fast travel out of a dungeon than be able to fast travel on the world map, because manually travelling across the open world is much more enjoyable than manually travelling back through a dungeon. After all, the open world looks great, there are places to discover, and you can even use a horse to speed it up. But no, this is the section the designers allow you to skip, whereas exiting a dungeon is something you have to do manually every time. Anyway, regardless of some of the strange decisions in regards to its implementation, fast travel seems like one of Oblivion's more minor problems, although this is a topic we'll revisit in the next video. For now though, it's time to move on to one of the few things Oblivion actually does better than any other Elder Scrolls game. Just like its side quests, Oblivion's factions now focus on telling a specific story, and while the exact results of this can be mixed, at their best, these factions offer some of the greatest moments in the entire series. Still, with only five factions to choose from, a mere half of the number that Morrowind had, there's more pressure on each faction to deliver, so let's start with those that might fall a little short. The Fighters Guild's biggest problem is its mediocrity. The total number of quests is high, and there is some non-linearity to what you do, but the overarching story of this questline takes a long time to get going, and the journey you take to get there just isn't that interesting. The Fighters Guild is a mercenary organisation, and as such you'll be sent to a variety of dangerous locations where you'll have to fulfil a range of basic objectives that all tend to feel suitable for a Fighters Guild member to be doing, but other than this, there isn't much about these quests that make them stand out. The story of this faction revolves around a rival mercenary group called the Blackwood Company. Where the Fighters Guild has standards and a code of honour, the Blackwood Company cares only for money and has more relaxed rules which has allowed them to start taking jobs away from the Fighters Guild. At the end of this questline you're tasked with investigating the Blackwood Company, which leads you to going undercover with the group in what is the one real standout moment of the questline. Here, you're inducted into the company, which leads you to being forced to consume a potion made of the sap of a history. This causes you to enter a kind of battle trance during your first job for them, but once the effects of this potion wear off, you find the goblin enemies you've been killing as part of the mission are actually just innocent people and farm animals, which explains why you were able to kill them so easily. It's a nice little twist, and with your hands suitably bloodied, and the secret of the Blackwoods Company revealed, you return to the Fighters Guild, only to be sent back to the company's headquarters to kill their leader, and destroy their dangerous history. With this, the questline is complete, and the position of leader of the Fighters Guild is granted to the player. Overall, this questline isn't bad, but there are just not enough interesting aspects to make it actually good. Really, the idea of a rival group, and the conflict that creates, is an okay setup, and not every faction needs to have some huge, world-shatteringly epic storyline. The problem has more to do with the execution of this premise. The Fighters Guild itself comes across as generic. The Blackwood Company aren't much better, being simplistic bad guys that just want money and don't care how they achieve this, and a lot of the quests don't have anything to do with the Blackwood Company anyway. Throughout the questline you interact with several reoccurring characters, such as the head of the Anvil chapter, the head of the Coral chapter, the Guildmaster, and a struggling rookie who later joins the Blackwood Company, named Maglir. But none of these characters have much personality. And ultimately this just leaves the faction questline as coming across as a bit bland. If the focus of the questline is on the conflict created by the Blackwood Company, 
then it would have been better if the politics of the Fighters Guild itself had been more of a focus. They could have had some characters wanting one approach, with others wanting something different, which leads to some faction related drama and maybe a power struggle and a schism within the group that the player will feel invested in. Maybe the Blackwood Company should have been formed during this questline from former members of the Fighters Guild that the player has interacted with already who later split off to form the company. This could have been used to make the conflict less black and white and more personal to the player, while also maybe leading to some more meaningful choices later on. Still, there is one thing I liked about the Fighters Guild questline, which is Maglir. Maglir is a struggling member of the guild who you interact with in several different quests. Eventually, he leaves the Fighters Guild to join the company, and ultimately ends up being the final boss of the questline, which is a little odd considering this guy wasn't able to kill a few low-level undead on his own a few quests earlier, but at least the writers were trying to do something more interesting with this character. Still, Maglir is effective in my opinion because so often in these faction questlines, they just revolve around the player doing the tasks given to them without ever interacting much with the other members of the guild. This represents a real missed opportunity because one of the main things that should make the player actually feel like they're in a guild is the other guild members. But for the most part, other guild members only seem to exist to give you quests and take up beds in the guild hall. And so the interactions with Maglir help remedy this a little, and these games would really benefit from allowing other guild members to play a larger role in these questlines more often. Moving on to the Mages Guild, and the story becomes a little more interesting at least. This questline focuses on the guild's recent outlawing of necromancy, which apparently wasn't very popular with all the necromancers, so now they're trying to destroy the guild. The necromancers are led by the King of Worms, who seemed a lot more interesting in Daggerfall, but otherwise, apart from this return character, this conflict is rather generic. Still, there's not a whole lot wrong with this story, and the need to get a recommendation from all the smaller guild halls before you can join the Arcane University was a nice idea, even if the university itself does come across as rather disappointing when you finally get there. The bigger problem with the Mages Guild is that there's not enough magic. Factions are important in these games because they allow you to feel like a member of these fictional organisations, which makes you feel like a part of the world. To feel like a member of the Mages Guild, however, there needed to be more mage-like activities. It's been commonly pointed out that you can complete this questline and become the Archmage of the Guild without any amount of magical ability. This wasn't possible in Morrowind because of each faction's skill requirements, and while I don't think skill requirements should have returned, there should still have been more quests in the Mages Guild that require you to cast spells. Even when Oblivion does come close to this, like when you recover the Ring of Burden from the Well in Shadenhall, the designers still seem to chicken out of actually making magic required by making tasks easy enough to be completed with no magic. And so, too often, Mage Guild quests will play out exactly the same as those in the Fighters Guild, i.e. go to a dungeon and kill enemies, when really they needed to do a better job at selling the illusion that you're a member of a magical organisation doing magical activities. This ends up seeming like the main thing the Mage Guild gets wrong, but luckily this isn't true for every faction. The arena isn't like other factions in this game. It's shorter, much less story focused, and mostly takes place in a single location. This faction clearly received fewer resources than the others, but what's good about the arena is that it does make you feel like an arena combatant doing arena combatant stuff. It also benefits from seeming a bit more unique compared to the other factions through its different structure. There is one problem with this questline however, which is that it's almost entirely focused on combat, and combat isn't one of Oblivion's strengths. In fact, the arena really drives that point home, as before every fight, your handler tells you about your opposition. Stuff like what equipment they use, or what tricks they might have that you need to look out for. And then you head off into battle, and the fight plays out exactly the same every time, because that's Oblivion's combat. It really makes you think to yourself, man, I wish there were tricks I had to look out for, and different tactics needed for different opponents as you head back down the excessively bloody entry hall, ready to rinse and repeat. There's also issues with how level scaling interacts with the arena, as the scaling ensures that your opponents have a completely flat difficulty curve. 
At least, they usually do. The Grand Champion is the only exception, but not because he's stronger. The Champion actually has a unique set of armor he wears, as opposed to the scaled gear of other arena fighters, which means if you do the arena later on in the game, the Grand Champion's non-scaling gear ends up being pathetically weak, making him by far the easiest fight in the entire questline. And while there is something funny about seeing this legendary fighter die in a couple hits in a game where every single other enemy is ridiculously tanky, this is also very stupid. Really, the arena was the perfect place to avoid using level scaling, because if the player is too weak for their next opponent, then great, let them go adventure somewhere else for a bit and then come back to try again later. This would be more realistic than every enemy being the exact same strength, and it's also a perfect way to make the character feel like they are getting stronger, and to make levels and equipment mean something. Still, despite these problems, the arena is a good addition to the world, and I have to wonder how much time was spent implementing it compared to the other factions. After all, I'd rather have two shorter but more unique factions than something like the Fighters Guild or the Mages Guild. One of the biggest problems with Oblivion's factions is it feels like there's barely any choice involved anymore. In Morrowind, it felt like the factions you chose to involve yourself with were a big part of what defined your character and made each playthrough unique. In Oblivion, I expect most players will join every faction on a single playthrough, which not only removes the important element of choice that Morrowind had, but also potentially creates an unrealistic situation where the player is the leader of every faction in the game. One way to avoid this would have been to create more factions, and if some of those factions had to be shorter to do this, like the arena was, then I think that may have been worth it. Still, it's difficult to know for sure, because while it's easy to say that you trade one fighter's guild for two more arenas, there are some factions in Oblivion worth more than two arenas. The best thing about the Thieves' Guild is the lack of dungeons, because dungeon crawling is so common in Oblivion's quests, that an entire questline without it is a breath of fresh air. The Thieves' Guild also puts a lot of focus on thievery. The stealing mechanics in the Elder Scrolls games are fairly basic, as you simply need to avoid being seen when picking something up. In Morrowind, this meant the challenge of the Thieves' Guild quests was more to do with finding the item you're looking for than actually stealing it. In Oblivion, the addition of quest markers means this is no longer a real concern, but luckily the quests are still well enough designed that you'll have to carefully use sneaking to remain undetected, and with an added gold penalty for killing anyone and some creative uses of Oblivion's mechanics, these quests end up being a lot of fun. Through this lack of dungeons and added focus on thievery, this questline ends up doing a good job at making you feel like a member of a thieves guild, which the addition of needing to sell stolen items to a fence also helps. And hell, even the story of this questline is good. The mystery of the Grey Fox's identity is suitably intriguing, the Order of the Blind Monk section involves some of the best lore in Oblivion, and the final quest, while annoyingly heavy on dungeons, is about a heist to steal an Elder Scroll, making it one of the highest stake finales to an Elder Scrolls faction in the series' history. All in all, the Thieves' Guild is really good, but even it can't compare to the game's final faction. It's a little cliché to praise Oblivion's Dark Brotherhood, but that doesn't mean that praise is undeserved. It starts with the way you join. Rather than walking into a guild hall and signing up, the more elusive Assassin's Guild will instead come to you following the first time you take an innocent's life. After being woken from your sleep the next time you rest by your recruiter, you are given an introductory assignment which sets you on the path of a guild-sponsored murderous rampage across the entire province. Where other factions struggled to produce one memorable character and cross their entire organisations, the Dark Brotherhood instead has an excess of personality. From the members themselves, to the reverence of the strange figure that is the Night Mother, to their hidden in plain sight guild hall, there is an over-the-top, hammy exuberance to this faction that is juxtaposed against the bloodthirsty subject matter to humorous effect. For example, this one time, I had a contract to kill a little Nord girl at her birthday party. <laughs> she asked me if I was the jester. So I said to her, No, I am a messenger of death. 
<laughs> you should have seen the look on her face. <laughs> anyway, she won't be seeing age six. Still, it's not just the writing of the Dark Brotherhood that knows how to have fun. This faction is also home to a lot of the most enjoyable quests in the game. Each one revolves around assassinating a certain target, where after being given the mission briefing, you can speak to your fellow guild members to get their opinion, which often yields some helpful advice while also making these other characters more endearing. Then when it comes to actually taking down the target, there's always a bonus objective to make things more challenging, such as killing someone while making it look like an accident, and the creative level design usually provides multiple avenues of approach and some genuinely interesting scenarios that will have you using stealth and subterfuge to live out your dreams of becoming a sociopathic assassin. The very best of these missions is Who Done It, which has the player heading to a party in an unlocked manner where they must murder each guest without the other guests witnessing them do it. This plays out like a classic Agatha Christie mystery novel, with each guest getting picked off one by one as the others try to work out who's responsible, all while the player secretly revels in the copious amounts of dramatic irony and self-created chaos. The fact these quests often involve real choice in how you carry them out is what really cements them as the game's best, but if great quests and memorable characters weren't enough, The Dark Brotherhood also has a fantastic storyline. After integrating yourself into the guild and getting to know each of its members, all while getting enough blood on your hands through missions to make Lady Macbeth blush, Lucian Lachance, the head of the more elite sect of the guild known as the Black Hand, will approach you with a special mission. It turns out there is a traitor within the guild, and you've been tasked with carrying out the age-old rite of purification to solve the problem. This involves killing every single other guild member of the Cyrodiil chapter, and when all your former friends lie dead by your hands, you begin working for Lucian himself through a series of dead drops. These work similarly to before. You're given a target, then you have to kill them, before heading to the next dead drop location to collect your rewards and the details of the next mission. Still, pretty soon the player will realise something's off. Each person you're tasked with killing seems highly trained and dangerous, and some even seem to anticipate your arrival, going as far as to hide out in the wilderness or other such hard to find locations. These contracts seem connected in some way, and they don't match any of those you did before, but with all your former colleagues no longer in any state to be handing out advice, you have no one to talk to about this, and no option but to keep following orders, until eventually you're confronted by a furious Lucian Lachance, who accuses you of betraying the Dark Brotherhood and killing its members. Turns out, the traitor wasn't one of the members you've killed at all, but rather one of the elite Black Hand, and they've been swapping the dead drops you received to instead send you after the remaining Black Hand members. Suddenly, everything starts to make sense, and you're now in a race against time to find the traitor before more damage can be done. Finding his hideout reveals a disturbing past that explains exactly why he's so hellbent on revenge, but before you can tell this to Lucian, the final members of the Black Hand reach him first mistaking Lucian for the traitor, with the player arriving just in time to witness the gruesome aftermath. Still at least now, the truth can finally be laid bare, and with pretty much the entire guild now slaughtered, the Night Mother herself comes forward to select you as the next listener, which is the one person chosen to receive her orders, and it's hard to argue with her choice. After all, by this point you have murdered your way through friend and foe, killing innocent and guilty alike, all in the name of the Brotherhood, until all that remains is you and the voice of the Night Mother in your ear, giving you your next target. But you wanted to be an assassin, right? This is the best faction in the entire series, by a considerable margin, and if ever there was an argument to be made in favour of Oblivion's more deliberate approach to using quests and factions to tell specific standalone stories, it's this. Oblivion's Dark Brotherhood is fantastic, and it's just a shame more parts of the game couldn't match this incredibly high level of quality, particularly the final part of the game. Morrowind used its main questline to connect the player to the world through its exploration of the settings, culture, and history. 
Oblivion's story is more of a traditional fantasy tale of the battle between good and evil where the fate of the world hangs in the balance. Except, in reality, it plays out more like a battle between Bethesda's desire to make something that seems epic versus the design and engine constraints they were forced to work with. So, on one side, you have someone at Bethesda saying, wouldn't it be cool to have a big battle where all of the cities come together to stand against the forces of oblivion? And then, on the other side, you have the game engine saying, fine, you can have your battle if you want, but your big army is going to have 11 NPCs. Feeling epic yet? Still, it would be unfair to say Bethesda is entirely defeated in their efforts, and the main questline of this game does have some entertaining moments. But, as in any war, there are casualties, and the victims of this particular battle end up being the credibility of the world itself. After seeing Emperor Uriel Septim get cut down by Daedric worshipping assassins, and being entrusted with a pricelet amulet that needs to be delivered to the final remaining heir to the throne, the player completes their escape from captivity and steps out into the world of Cyrodiil, free at last. Legend says that an heir to the Imperial Throne must always wear the Amulet of Kings to maintain the barriers between Tamriel and the realms of Oblivion. So, with the Amulet in your possession, the fate of the world technically sits in your backpack, which I guess means it would be kind of a dick move to not deliver it. That said, you could argue in an RPG, players should be able to make such moves, and it is certainly possible that a person in this position, i.e. one who has recently gained their freedom and has no material wealth to their name, might take a different course of action here and maybe sell the amulet at the nearest shop and leave the world saving to someone more qualified than a level 1 adventurer. There is a certain percentage of players who will ignore the main story in these games, and that's a valid response to being set free in a big open-ended world. Some people suggest that the main story should accommodate these players by doing its best to avoid a sense of urgency, so people don't feel obligated to complete it. But I don't think forcing the story to accommodate all types of players is necessarily required in these games. Instead I think the approach that might work best is to ensure the story reacts to players ignoring it, and while this might be hard to implement in certain games, in Oblivion it wouldn't be. Part of Oblivion's main quest involves dangerous Oblivion gates opening across the land. This is meant to be caused by the death of the Emperor, but in practice that's not actually true. The real cause of Oblivion gates opening everywhere is the player bringing the Emperor's heir, Martin, to the Blade's hideout at Cloud Ruler Temple. Not because of any logical connection between the events, but instead because this is when these gates are programmed to start appearing. The trigger for these Oblivion Gates could have instead been based on a period of time passing in-game, and they could then become more common the longer the main story is ignored. This would make more sense, and it could provide an actual consequence to ignoring the story, while also reintroducing meaning to the passage of time for the first time since Daggerfall. Many people criticise Bethesda's more modern games for not having main stories that players can choose to ignore, like Morrowind did. The problem with this is that the introduction to Morrowind's story is, honestly, a little boring, and I say that as someone who's a huge fan of the story, but it does start very slowly, and this could easily fail to give players a reason to want to continue it, which would lead them to missing out on much of the best content in the game. And while it is possible to create a good story that still avoids any sense of urgency, it's not always easy, and I don't think it would be needed if the games were instead designed to react to players ignoring the story in a way that makes sense. After all, if these games cover hugely important events, it's logical that these events should impact the world in some way, regardless of whether the player directly involves themselves in them. The only problem with this suggestion for Oblivion is that it might inadvertently lead some players into completing more Oblivion Gates, and nobody wants to complete more Oblivion Gates, but we'll get to that soon. To get back on track with the story, after delivering the amulet, whether after one in-game day or 1000, you're then sent to find the heir to the throne, Martin, who is living as a priest in the city of Kavach, unaware of his royal blood. When you reach the city, you find that it's been attacked by the forces of Oblivion via a gate that opened nearby. 
While the city is mostly destroyed, the player nevertheless drives out the enemy Daedra, finds Martin, and heads into the Oblivion Gate to seal it shut. These gates are basically a special type of dungeon, and over the course of the story you will close many of them. Most players dislike these sections, probably because they're time consuming and repetitive, with long stretches of uninteresting walking, combined with plenty of unengaging combat against HP inflated enemies. Dungeons in general aren't that interesting in this game, but these manage to be even worse, and this can really harm the main story. At one point you're tasked with closing six of these in a row outside each major city, and if the player wasn't sick of them before this, they sure will be afterwards. But it's even worse for players who don't understand that the gates found all over this world are completely optional, and so will try to close them whenever they see them, in an attempt to combat the forces of oblivion. And then, after closing 10, 20, maybe even more gates, and getting completely sick of the sight of them, they then continue the main story, only to be told they have to close even more. If you do find yourself in this situation, you'll also notice how similar these gates can be, as there are only 11 different layouts in the game, and so sooner rather than later they will start to repeat, meaning you end up going through the same exact dungeons again and again. Part of what makes these gates disappointing is that there's no reason to expect this content to be low quality. These gates are the symbol of the game, the focus of the main story, and what NPCs never seem to stop talking about, so you'd expect them to be some of the game's best content, yet it's more like the opposite. Really, Bethesda should have went for a quality over quantity approach to these gates, with each gate having some kind of unique quest associated with it, like the Chaden Hall one does with the Order of Knights who enter the gate before you arrive. This would make these sections more interesting, and if the cost to this was that there would only be enough gates to have one per city, then I don't see what the problem with this is. I mean, there's no shortage of dungeons in this game. Also, when these gates are introduced in the story at Kavach, they're made to seem like a big deal. After all, one gate is enough to destroy an entire city, so the fact they appear everywhere on the map, and yet there's no consequence to ignoring them, doesn't make much sense. If Bethesda did want to add more gates to the game to make it seem like the world is in danger, they should have just added some non-dungeon, more minor gates, which could spawn a couple waves of enemies and then close without the player needing to go inside. This could communicate that the barriers between the realms of Oblivion and Tamriel are breaking down without the need for endless repetitive dungeons. Still, with the Oblivion gate at Kavach closed and Martin escorted to the Blades, the story will continue with the player investigating the group of Daedric worshippers that killed the Emperor. They belong to a cult called the Mythic Dawn, who follow the Daedric Prince of Destruction, Mehrunes Dagon. Your investigation leads you to infiltrating their hideout where you can go undercover and pretend to be one of their members, in a section that is interesting, but would have been even better if it was longer and showed more of what normal life is like within the cult. Still through this you learn of the Mythic Dawn leader, Mankar Cameron, who has acquired the amulet you were supposed to get to Martin to end the Oblivion Crisis, which he stole from the Blades while you were away. However, Mankar Cameron resides in his own realm of oblivion that you have no way to access, so the player is sent to retrieve several important artifacts that Martin believes should allow you to travel to this realm. Before you've collected all of these, you learn that a major oblivion gate is going to open outside the city of Burma, which leads you to visiting each of the other cities to close oblivion gates near them in order to acquire allies for Burma's defence. You can try asking the council in the Imperial City, who are the current rulers of the Imperial Empire, but apparently the Imperial Legion doesn't really have any men available at the moment, so no luck there. Anyway, after touring the cities of the realm to assemble all available men to fight by your side in the greatest army the Imperial Empire has ever seen, all 11 of you prepare for battle. You then listen to a motivational speech, defend the city of Burma with the boys, close another gate of oblivion, get all the artifacts together, head into Mankar Cameron's realm, kill him, kill anyone else you don't like the look of too, get the amulet, give the amulet to Martin, and then you all head off to the Imperial City for one last big battle in the streets, where an avatar of Mehrunes Dagon himself appears to rain terror from above, until Martin uses the amulet and sacrifices himself to summon the spirit of Akatosh, 
the dragon god of time, who defeats Mayrunes and seals shut the gates of oblivion forevermore. The nice thing about finishing the main questline is no more oblivion gates, and while that may sound like I'm just being snide due to how disappointing the gates are, I'm actually being sincere. Oblivion gates do create a sense that the world is in danger, and so finishing the main questline and closing every last one of them permanently feels like a true achievement. And due to how unenjoyable these gates are to go through, knowing they're gone forever is also rather cathartic. What's less positive about the main questline is that conflict between presentation and ambition. From the assassination of the Emperor, to the siege of Kavach, or the defence of Burma, or the final showdown in Imperial City, Oblivion tries so hard to create epic moments full of action, with sky-high stakes, avatars of gods, and the fate of cities being decided before your eyes. But during these moments, there's never much believability. A big empire should have an army, and if the world is being overrun by Daedra, people should be fighting back. Instead, the only person who ever manages to close an Oblivion Gate in this game is you. I mean, the fate of the realm literally hangs in the balance here, and yet you're the only one doing anything about it, which makes the world seem small and slightly pathetic. And so, Oblivion's story may manage to be regularly action-packed, generally exciting, and occasionally epic, but to achieve this, it often undermines the world itself through its failure to display its grandiose events with the sense of scale or the degree of authenticity that they require. In the end, Morrowind's approach to using the main story to tell the world's backstory worked better, and when looking at these two games side by side, it's easy to miss the greater world building and depth of Morrowind's story. But for fans of Morrowind, Bethesda had one last trick up their sleeve to try to win them over. In 2006, the Xbox Live Marketplace was less than one year old, and downloadable content was still in its infancy. Bethesda's approach to DLC with Oblivion saw them testing the waters of acceptability, resulting in the infamous horse armour, and a number of more substantial, if forgettable, pieces of smaller content. Amidst these less impressive additions, however, were two high-quality expansions, similar to what Morrowind saw with Tribunal and Blood Moon. One of the main things that stands out about these two expansions is how each seems designed to try to make up for one of the areas Oblivion could be considered lacking when compared to Morrowind. Knights of the Nine is a shorter, more narrative-focused expansion which focuses on a key part of Cyrodiil's history. More specifically, it explores the story of Perennial Whitestrake, who slew the Aeliad sorcerer king Umaril to free man from Aeliad rule hundreds of years ago. The Aeliads were an ancient group of elves that previously ruled Cyrodiil, and their ruins still dot the landscape years later. Knights of the Nine also explores the role of the Eight Divines that constitute Cyrodiil's main religion, and this greater focus on lore is appreciated after Oblivion's main game gave this aspect so little attention. The story of this expansion also isn't bad, making this a good addition to the base game. That said, I do feel this expansion doesn't quite manage to remedy Oblivion's lack of lore problem, if only because a big part of what made Morrowind's lore so interesting was that it felt like a natural part of the world. By comparison, Knights of the Nine feels more deliberate, as if it's only interested in exploring this lore to use it to produce an epic questline for the player. This makes it come across as a little bit more tacked on as a result, even if the content is still good. Oblivion's next expansion, Shivering Isles, makes for an even more interesting case study. It's much longer than Knights of the Nine, and transports players to the Daedric Prince Sheogorath's personal realm of madness, which is depicted as an impressive sized island that the player is free to explore. Shivering Isles can almost feel like it was designed to shut up all the people who complained that Cyrodiil was too safe or generic, particularly those who might have decried the loss of Morrowind's weirdness who saw Oblivion's trees and wished for mushrooms, and who wanted to return to a land that was alien and unexpected. The thing that really surprised me about this, however, was how many people thought it was a success. Plenty of people praised this expansion as a return to what made Morrowind so good. 
After all, Morrowind was weird, but the Shivering Isles are even weirder, and this is reflected in its inhabitants, its landscapes, and even its ruler. You never know what to expect on this island, as the realm of madness is a place where anything can happen. In fact, this randomness and unpredictability is interwoven into the world's fabric by its creator, and there's nothing wrong with any of this in itself, but I don't think this is actually similar to Morrowind. In Morrowind, everything was thought out and connected. Much of the world was mundane, and what wasn't always seemed like it had an explanation. By contrast, the Shivering Isles are weird for the sake of being weird, which is almost the opposite of Morrowind's approach to world building. Still, even if the Shivering Isles doesn't replicate what made Morrowind work so well, it makes up for this with understanding what made Oblivion work. In fact, Oblivion itself was often at its most entertaining when it was wacky and more detached from reality, and here's a whole expansion where that can be turned up several degrees, without the separation from reality ever seeming like a problem. Shivering Isles is almost like a hyper-concentrated version of Oblivion that plays to the base game's strengths in a way that an expansion probably should. And it's fun, even if Shia Gorath is an overrated character. Still, this isn't a Morrowind-like experience. Really, it's not even close. So, where does that leave Oblivion? It can be hard to view Oblivion outside of Morrowind's shadow, and this video hasn't made much of an attempt to do that. So far. The truth is, for someone who enjoyed Morrowind for qualities Oblivion often lacks, Oblivion can seem like a disappointing sequel, and a slightly worrying shift in focus away from what the series should be about. But it's only fair to at least try to evaluate this game independently of its predecessor, because Morrowind may not have been a good follow-up to Daggerfall, but that didn't mean it wasn't good. So, how true is the same for Oblivion? Well, this is still a game focused on creating an immersive world for players to explore, and so it can be assessed on that basis. Oblivion tries to make this exploration much more accessible, with the introduction of level scaling, quest markers, fast travel, the more traditional setting, the more epic main story, and other such changes. And one thing that can be said about Oblivion is that it is successful with its main goal of making the experience more accessible. All of these features and changes do have at least some cost on the world itself though, and for some of the less successful changes, like the level scaling, the costs hardly seem worth it. That said, I think it's a testament to Bethesda's skill at creating virtual worlds that despite so many of the game's flaws, they were still able to create a world that players truly wanted to explore. This was in large part due to Oblivion's, for their time, great visuals, which when combined with the size and openness of the world, makes for an experience players can truly lose themselves in, and which can provide hours upon hours of enjoyment. But maybe it's because of these very qualities that the lack of depth to this world ends up being so disappointing. Morrowind rewarded players who spent hours within it, with rich lore and credible world building, and the more time you spent on Vardenfell, the more believable the place seemed to be. The same can't be said about Oblivion, however. With time, its flaws become more noticeable, its world shows more evidence of being designed around the player, and there's much less to discover for anyone who really delves deeply into its lore or backstory. And so, while I don't think it's fair to criticise Oblivion for trying to be more accessible, it is fair to criticise its world for being more shallow, because despite how often these two things seem to be connected, increasing accessibility doesn't mean there has to be a decrease in depth, and if Oblivion had constructed its world and mechanics more carefully, I think more of Morrowind's better features could have been preserved. But Oblivion still deserves credit for its ambition, and for all the ways its world was such a step above almost any other created during the same time period. Features like the Radiant AI system, or the realism of its terrain, or just the quantity of content contained within this game are still genuinely impressive. And if Oblivion did get some parts of what it changed wrong, 
That didn't mean Bethesda couldn't learn from these failures to refine some of its new systems and strike a balance between accessibility and depth in a way that takes the best from both Morrowind and Oblivion to create something even better. That isn't exactly what happened though. Thank you everyone for watching, and thank you to Core for sponsoring this video. The next video will be the final part of this series, and hopefully it won't take too long. So, I guess I'll see you in the next one.